Little Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of Principles by Ray Dalio, Life and Work. Ray Dalio, who started the company Bridgewater when he was 25 years old, just as a one-man operation in his spare bedroom. And over the last couple of decades, he's built that up pretty nicely to a personal net wealth of about $20 billion. And Bridgewater has about $160 billion of funds under management at the moment. He's a pretty impressive dude. He's I think the, in the top 50 most wealthy people in the world, and especially because he came from absolutely nothing. So on that journey from starting with nothing to be where he is today, he's obviously gone through a lot of ups and downs and trials and tribulations and a pretty wild journey. And this is, I think, where books can be absolutely incredible because all his lessons in his whole entire life can be packaged for this $30 book and eight-hour read and now a 30-minute 30, 30 podcast. So uh, he's put it down into principles, meaning that the same situations pop up in his life and will pop up in our life. And he just sees it as another one of those, he'd call it, um, meaning we can learn from previous lessons to apply it for our decision-making in future events. What would happen if you didn't have principles was every time something happened, you'd see it as a brand new, isolated, different type of situation. But what Ray is saying is really they just boil down to a couple of different categories. And if you've got principles for tackling each type of category, it means that you're well and truly on your way to making the right decision more often than not. And importantly, Ray says that this book is full of his principles that he's taken through life and work, but it's important to make your own principles as well. You shouldn't just adopt anybody's principles because we all have our own different goals and our own different human natures. So it's important to think carefully about what your principles are. Take a bit of inspiration from Ray. He's got some phenomenal ideas. So I'd say adopt a few of his, but think carefully about what your principles are as well. So this book's going to be in three parts. The first part is essentially Ray's autobiography. The second part is life principles. And the third part, all the principles he's learned from his work and running and managing his organization. So in this episode, we're going to mix part one and two, uh, his autobiography, and then dropping on the principles that he's learnt along the way. So the story kicks off in about 1967. So Ray, from the very start, he was very interested in investing and in how financial markets worked. He had a few early wins with a few stocks, but pure luck and pure chance for these early wins. Then in 1970 to 71, he started to make some bigger bets because he noticed that gold was beginning to tick up it's no competitor to the US dollar, but then the government basically went against their word, um, stopped tying the US dollar to gold, and because of that, Ray made some big bets thinking that the US dollar was going to go down, the stock market was going to crash relative to other currencies, and it was going to devalue basically everything in the US. So Ray made his bets, but it turned out the absolute opposite happened to what he thought would happen. The stock market jumped by 4%, and then obviously a lot of Ray's bets he made all ended up being losses. What he realized through this circumstance was that he missed the opportunity by learning through history. This exact circumstance where currencies were no longer pegged to a commodity like gold, this had happened many times before in history and a similar result happened in the stock market jumping in overall value. So a principle that Ray took from this and from a lot of other experiences is to be radically open-minded. And he said that this radical open-mindedness is motivated by the genuine worry that you might not be seeing your choices optimally. So instead, it's the ability to effectively explore different points of view and different possibilities without letting your ego or your blind spots get in the way. So Ray had a big blind spot. He said, you better make sense of what happened to other people in other times and other places because if you won't know if these things can happen to you and if they do you won't know how to deal with them so ray was essentially way too sure of what he knew at the time and and didn't yet have the ability to deal with well what not knowing and he says this is more important than whatever you actually do know another couple of important principles around this radical open-mindedness he says don't worry about looking good don't worry about being right worry about achieving your goal So rather than thinking about what other people think of you, rather than letting your ego get in the way and thinking that you have to look good to everybody, the most important thing, much more important than looking good is actually achieving your goal. So if you've got a goal in place, being radically open-minded allows you to put the ego to the side and just focus on the goal, not about how you're appearing on the outside to everyone else. Yeah, most people out there usually try to prove that they have a good answer when in reality they actually don't. And it's because they have this common view that great people have all the answers. And I think a lot of people have that 
general belief that if you can answer something correctly and something that sounds really good, then you're you know you're a good person, you're highly valuable. But Ray goes against that. He says you're better off acting like you don't know because if you've got an empty cup and you're starting with that assumption that you don't know, then there's an opportunity to actually learn from every single experience that you come across. Yeah, this radical open-mindedness really accelerates the learning process. Naturally, we fear sort of the unknown or the fear of looking stupid, but if we put ourselves out there with radical transparency, radical open-mindedness, we're actually able to learn things. And Ray says that you need to sincerely believe that you might not know the best possible path and recognize that your ability to deal well with not knowing is more important than whatever it is you don't know. So rather than focusing on what you don't know, you need to deal well with not knowing. And he says that in dealing well with this, not knowing that the radically open-minded people, they're going to be the ones coming up with the right sorts of questions. They're going to ask the smart people for the answers compared to the other people who aren't this radically open-mindedness. They're just going to be pushing their own agenda. Whenever you're making changes of this sort, whether it's being, he says, mixing radical open-mindedness and radical transparency, it's a little bit weird to do at the start, but he says it's like learning any kind of skill, like presenting in public or anything like that. It's very uncomfortable at the start, but with time, if you learn that this is the best way to deal with situations, it's uncomfortable not to be open-minded and transparent in such situations. And this leads us into the period around 1979, 1980, 1981. Ray says that the economy was perhaps in the most volatile period ever. He says this this was even worse than the more recent GFC around the 2007, 2008. He said that this period at the end of the 70s, start of the 80s was just wild. And he felt that the, the Fed, the Federal Reserve, was stuck between a rock and a hard place. They almost had to print money in order to revive the economy, which was really sputtering and and struggling to keep going. But at the same time, there was inflation as well. And by printing money, they'd they'd keep extending this inflation. So they were really like in a lose-lose situation. They either, by trying to save the economy, they'd have too much inflation, or if they tried to curb inflation, the economy wouldn't be growing fast enough. Yeah, it's a little bit like today. A lot of people are in huge debt, and the way to get rid of the debt is just inflate it all away, and it kind of disappears. But then if you do that... Um, interest rates go up and then people's debts, the way to service that just goes through the roof and the economy absolutely collapses. So Ray started writing about all of this and going on all the news outlets and everything. He called it the next depression in perspective in some of his articles. And he said that the, the enormity of their debt implies that the depression will be as bad or worse than it was in the 1930s. So this is the, the kind of calls that he was making. So he saw only two scenarios, accelerating inflation or deflationary depression he bought gold, which performs well in the accelerating deflation, and bonds, which helps perform in deflationary depressions. So in both cases, he's avoiding stocks altogether because he's loading up on gold and bonds because these are the only two scenarios that he's predicting. In 1982, Mexico defaulted on its debt, and it was feared that many, many, many other countries were about to follow suit. And Ray was actually presenting in front of the Federal Reserve uh, and he sort of had this, he came to this position here. He said, okay, I've had a look at everything. And in my you know, professional opinion, obviously he's got his personal money on the line. He's got his client's money on the line. He said that there's a 75% chance that the Federal Reserve's effort to try and save this, we're going to fall short. There was a 20% chance that it would initially succeed at a little bit of short-term stimulation, but then ultimately fail in the longer term. And then there was a 5% chance that it would save the economy, but then hyperinflation would take over. So Ray thought, okay, there's a there's pretty much a 100% chance everything's going to go bad. And so he's made his bets according to these three different scenarios, and he was entirely, entirely wrong. The thing that he said was a 0% chance of happening was actually, actually happened, and it was the strongest period of economic growth pretty much in history. <laughs> yeah, the strongest bull market of all time in 18 years, and All of his clients' money and his own money wasn't even a part of this at the very start. It actually went the other way. So obviously he lost a lot of money and Bridgewater Associates at the time had a bunch of employees, but one by one, as this bull market was going forward, he had to keep letting them all go. It even got to the point where he had to borrow $4,000 from his dad um, until until he sold his car. And he was at a fork in the road, like this sort of thing, starting his own business, it was going hey, it's going pear shaped. Um, you know, should he just go back to Wall Street and become an employee again where he's got the safe money? This is the period of time that Ray calls his abyss. He's at the absolute bottom here. And he's actually found that in the years since that looking at 
some of the most extraordinarily successful people around the world, they've had similar big, painful failures that have taught them lessons on how to succeed in future. One he talks about often throughout the book is Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs obviously founded Apple and built it up nicely, but then he got fired from his own company that he created. And Jobs said that it was this awful tasting medicine, but I guess the patient needed it. Sometimes life hits you in the head with a brick, so don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. And so Steve Jobs was saying that even his greatest abyss, getting fired from his own company, getting whacked over the head with a brick was actually what led him to come back even stronger and build Apple up even bigger when he did eventually return. Ray's saying that hitting rock bottom is just part of the journey for everyone who actually goes to reach his level of success. If you think about it, in order to do exceptionally well, you really get to push your limits to the absolute extreme. And if you push your limits to this extreme, every now and then you're going to crash and it's going to hurt a hell of a lot. And when this happens, you're going to think that you failed and this won't be true unless you give up. So in these situations, believe it or not, in that moment, that pain is going to fade away and there's going to be a lot more opportunities ahead of you, though it's really hard to see at the time when you're at rock bottom. And the important thing is at rock bottom, there's these unique lessons that you can always take away from these failures and you can gain the humility and radical open-mindedness that Ray did in these circumstances to increase your chances of the long-term success. Ray said that it's like a three-part equation for a successful life. It's dreams plus reality plus determination. You need all of those three things. If any one of them are missing, it's not going to work out. If you've got just dreams but no reality, then you're off in fairyland. If you've got the determination but you're not dreaming big, you're probably going to work hard but to no end goal. You really need all three of those, those dreams plus reality plus determination to tie all together for this successful life. So in retrospect, the mistakes he led to the crash seemed obvious. Uh, he was wildly overconfident. One of the quotes he looks back on now that he said at the time, again, it was like, there'll be no soft landing. I can say that with absolute certainty because I know how markets work. I'm big Ray Dalio here, <laughs> right? And then again, through this lesson, he saw the value of going back and studying history. And I think this is what he gets back to over and over again, how Bridgewater became the company they are today is because they applied history through their economic decision-making through the formulas that they had to beat the market uh, relative to their competitors. So he's had this failure here. He's tasted defeat. Before that failure, he was obviously super, super confident. He said, you know, I can say this with absolute certainty. I know how markets work. He had so much confidence. Uh, he had the dreams and determination, maybe not the reality. And so what these, this big failing really taught him was that from then on, he was moving forward with the sense that there was always this high likelihood of getting whacked again. So rather than being so confident and so sure of himself, he was moving forward with a bit more realism, with a bit more open-mindedness, always worried about what could the next big thing, the next big unforeseen thing that I'm so sure could never happen, but would actually happen. So he's approaching his investment decisions and his life decisions with a lot more open-mindedness and looking at all the possible scenarios, which allowed him to be a much more successful investor. Yeah. It gives us a glimpse also into the analogy that he runs his life by. I think it's interesting to hear what everyone's analogy is because I think it does shape a lot of their own decisions. For Ray, he sees life as... He sees that to live a great life, you need to cross a great jungle with a lot of different animals in there there who can take you down and a lot of different dangers and everything and you've got two choices you can stay safe where you are and have an ordinary life and not have to deal with the jungle whatsoever or you can take that huge risk and cross the jungle where the big panda and the 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 <laughs> ape and the and the snakes they can just so dangerous yeah they just look big and fluffy and cuddly Ray's, they're vicious yeah. they're vicious in ray's jungle yeah. <laughs> but you know, you got to get past all those those obstacles to get to the terrific life. So that's the choice we've all got. We can stay safe where we are now or we can cross the jungle. A little bit like the analogy we use sometimes is like stepping in the arena um, rather than sitting on the sidelines. Yeah, one big theme that runs throughout Ray's principles is a lot about nature and a lot about evolution. And he says you need to be constantly evolving and improving yourself. And for Ray, he says pain plus reflection equals progress. So he's obviously felt this massive pain and through throughout this reflection and looking about and looking into what he did, so maybe shifting from I know I'm right to saying how do I know I'm right, this is the reflection that allowed him to then progress. So a little bit of pain, a little bit of reflection allows the progression and that leads to all this evolution, moving forward, getting stronger and improving his out, outlook. He says this 
idea of evolution is the greatest force in the universe. It doesn't just happen to evolve all the different species and the biodiversity they see everywhere, but it really is the path to evolving you as a person as well. He says it consists of adaptions and inventions that provide spurts of benefits, so these little wins that you might have along the way, but those wins over time decline in value. And that painful decline leads to either a new adaptation, then you have another win and you keep moving forward, and new inventions that bring new products and new behaviors or new capabilities, or it can actually decline if you let it and then it just go toward death. And if you look at any organization or person, you realize that is true. The world is littered with once great things that deteriorated and failed, and it's very rare for organizations or people to keep on reinventing themselves and prove and then reach the, the heights of greatness. So again, this is one of the decisions we've got every time. You can either learn valuable lessons from all your mistakes and press on forward and be better equipped in the long run to succeed. So it's a decision to evolve whenever this circumstance presents itself or you die. As humans, we have a bit of an advantage when it comes to this sort of stuff that we can maximize our own evolution. We have the ability uh, to allow ourselves to reflect on ourselves and direct our own evolution. So rather than being passive in evolution, allowing time and uh, the outside world to guide where we go next, we can actually be a little bit more conscious in directing our own evolution. We can evolve faster and faster than any other species by allowing ourselves to look at our flaws and look at our goals and decide what do we need to do in order to evolve from where we are now to where we want to be. For, so from the perspective of maximizing your evolution, obviously pain is a very good thing because pain plus reflection equals progress going back to that equation. There's no avoiding pain if you're going after these ambitious goals and if you're trying to maximize your own evolution. Most people, when this pain comes, they have a time to actually re- remember to actually reflect on the pain and see what the lesson was from it. They just take the pain and move forward. So I think we need to remind ourselves, look back on our painful periods and reflect on what the lessons are to maximize evolution so to increase the odds of success in the long run. So for Ray Dalio, even after this crash, he knew he was going to be the type of person who's going to cross the jungle despite its risks to get the most out of life, to live an incredible life. So the question turned into how to cross this dangerous jungle without being killed. In this period... Uh, the crash, in retrospect, he's saying now, was probably the best thing that ha- ever happened to him because it gave him humility and to balance his aggressiveness. So as a summary of Ray's principles that he's learned along the way, the first one we've spoken a little bit about, it's embrace reality and deal with it. He says you need to be a hyper-realist. And remember that equation we mentioned, you need the right mix of dreams plus reality plus determination, and that equals a successful life. He says that this important mix of radical open-mindedness plus radical transparency is what you need in order to learn and move forward. He says that the truth, or more precisely, an accurate understanding of reality is an essential foundation for any good outcome. We're all going to get slapped up a bit in a few different ways and go through pain, Ray said he got a brick thrown across his face everyone's going to get something along those lines and every time this happens we've got a choice to actually evolve and learn from the situation and in the long term we're going to be much better off because of this situation or we can choose to die and do a spiral downwards to death another important one in this idea of reality and hyper realism is to weigh your second and third order consequences and own your own outcome so rather than just looking at Uh, an action and then the response you need to think of what's the response to that response what are the second order consequences that happen after the first order consequences the second principle he's got is use the five-step process to get what you want out of life and it comes up in a hell of a lot of books and that's the importance and the utility of having clear goals and actually having a target for what you want out of your life Yeah, so the first step of this five-step process is to have clear goals. He says you need to prioritize. You can pretty much have anything you want in life, but you can't have everything you want in life. So this first step of laying out the clear priorities and those clear goals allows you to decide what you really want in life and letting some of those other ideas slip to the wayside. So Ray making it to the top 50 in the world, he would say something like this, but never rule out a goal because you think it's unattainable. Basically, everything out there is possible if you can just prioritize Great expectations, so having great expectations of yourself is the seeds really to having great capabilities. The second step is to identify problems and then don't tolerate problems. So 
obviously you can't just set your goal and then you're going to get there. Along the journey, there's going to be dips, there's going to be problems along the way. You need to accurately identify what that problem is and reconcile within yourself that you're not going to tolerate this. The third step is when you diagnose these problems, you need to find their root causes. You might, for example, have a problem in your day-to-day work where your boss is being an ass for whatever reason and you're trying to solve that problem, specifically that problem, but the root cause might be you're in a shit job in a shit industry or whatever you need to get out of. Yeah, he says that before you decide what to do about it, you need to decide what is, as in that you can't just go straight into problem-solving mode. You first need to get to that root cause of the problem. So make sure you're solving the right problem in the first place. So the fourth step then is to design a plan. In Ray's philosophy of looking at life like a bit of a machine, you need to work out, okay, something clearly went wrong when you had this problem, you weren't doing something right. So you need to design the plan to make things go right for the next time you have a crack at it. And the fifth step is push through to completion. So if you've got a good plan, but you can't execute on anything, obviously you're not going anywhere. You need a plan, but you need to have the ability to execute And the way to execute is to really have good habits and these are really vastly underrated. He's a big fan of your man's book, uh, Charles Duhigg, The Power of Habit. Um, If we got good work habits and every day if you're just chipping away at something, you can really accomplish great things. Ray's third big principle is be radically open-minded. It's almost a bit of a subset of uh, the first one. It was like uh, principle 1.3, but it's also principle 3 as well. Be radically open-minded. So a big part of radical open-mindedness is the belief that you might not know the best possible path and recognize that your ability to deal well with not knowing is more important than whatever it is you do know. So it's coming with the assumption that you don't know hardly anything, which is definitely the case. You're one person out of billions of other people around the world and your subset of experience is is almost nothing compared to really what is out there in terms of knowledge. A practical thing that Ray likes to always do, he says, you need to triangulate your views with believable people who are willing to disagree. So it can be a bit of a trap to just find people who all think the same thing as you. Ray says you need to actively go out there and find people with different views, find both parts of the story and not just people who are differing for the sake of differing, people who he says are believable, people who have a bit of trust And then you need to take on a little bit of both and try and get your views to be somewhere in the middle. And he says, understand how you can become radically open-minded. So a bit of self-awareness there, understand where your blind spots and your weaknesses might be. He also says a big part of this is meditation. Uh, Big Ray, he did transcendental meditation along with Big Arnie. There's a few big dogs out there who've done transcendental meditation, but he got a huge return on investment in all the meditation that he's done in his life. Big principle number four is understand that people are wired differently. You can't just think that everybody is the same as you. They think the same way as you. They've got the same goals as you. You really need to realize that everybody is different. We're all born differently with different attitudes and they can sometimes help us and they can sometimes hurt us, but it's important to recognize that everybody is doing their own thing for them and you've got to start to get a truer understanding and empathy for other people. Yeah, people fall in different places along the spectrum of things like introversion versus extroversion, intuiting versus sensing, thinking versus feeling, planning versus perceiving. Then you've got creators out there, refiners, advancers, executors, flexors, people who focus on tasks versus people who focus on goals versus the people who are really big picture. So there's a huge variety of people out there and if someone's different to you, it's actually a very good thing because if you can work with them, they can compensate for what your weaknesses are and combine it with your strengths. Uh, you can actually be much more effective. Yeah, Ray loves the Myers-Briggs uh, personality test and they do a whole bunch of different personality tests for the people that he hires at Bridgewater. And he even makes baseball cards for every single employee with sort of their, their stats and some of their strengths and weaknesses. It'd be, so, pretty, uh, it'd be pretty interesting working with at, uh, Bridgewater yeah, after reading this book. It certainly would be. So then you can go to someone and look up their stats and uh, maybe someone who's thinking big picture, don't give them the nitty-gritty task that you need to have super, super strong accuracy about looking into the finer details. So using baseball cards and using all these personality tests, Ray's able to put the right people in the right situations. Yeah, and that's something that Peter Drucker in The Effective Executive really outlined. He says, make strengths productive. Is that what he says? Uh, yeah. Oh. Sounds good. Sounds, Sounds good. good. <laughs> you don't remember, do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but that was definitely part of uh, Drucker's advice in his book. The fifth principle is learn how to make decisions effectively. 
So the decision-making process is two steps. First, you need to learn everything about the situation you're in from uh, history and experience, and then you make the decision. I like this idea that he talks about navigating the levels effectively. So whenever you're making decisions, there are the really, really high level decisions in terms of like sort of the path that you want to go down. And then there's the lower level nitty gritty, finer details. So he's sort of like, there's sort of A, B, C, D, E. And then within each of those, there might be A, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, B, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And he says that some people, if they're going through decision making on their, they're having discussions about what steps to take, they might talk about A1 and then B3 and then D7 and then back to C1. And it's really unproductive. Ray says you need to either go sort of across, so forming, you know, A, B, C, D, E, forming the higher level stuff. And then you go down A1, 2, 3, 4. You can sort of dive deeply as long as you've got a nice structure to it rather than just being all over the shop and the discourse comes completely irrelevant and unproductive. I like how he also says be imprecise. So say if you're given the equation 38 multiplied by 12, a lot of people through their head will find it an extremely painful ordeal and be very hard to come up with the answer. But someone like Ray, he says, all right, 38, pretty close to 40, 12, put that back down to 10, 38 times 12, it's around about 400. So it's a very quick way and yeah. imprecise way of doing things. So uh, whenever you come across any situations, be imprecise and you can actually do complex algorithms in your head with this kind of approach. So that's Principles by Ray Dalio. There were the his five life principles after following on from some of his autobiographical journey to get to this point. And remember, as Ray said, don't just accept his principles as the right way to do it. Start to think about what are your principles? What are some of your life principles? How are you going to make decisions in the future based on these high level principles that you've made for yourself? If you enjoyed that episode, go out and share it with your friends. It's actually really easy to do now with Spotify. You just hit the three dots in the top corner of the screen, and then from that, you hit share. And then you can go straight to Instagram stories and make sure you tag us in so we know who you are and then all your friends can learn from this episode also.